Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Sharon Florentine. Thank you for joining us for today's DevOps.com webinar, The Limitless Possibilities of IoT and Edge Computing with a Modern Distributed Database, brought to you by Datastax. Before we get started today, I do have some housekeeping items I need to go over with you. First, this webinar is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of it, you'll be able to go back and watch it again. We'll be sending an email with instructions for how to access the webinar on demand, or you can always visit us at devops.com slash webinars, and it will be there for you as well. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during the presentation. You can use the Q&A tab on your webinar console, send those right in. We will try to get to as many as possible at the end of the presentation. And finally, if you stick around till the end, we'll be doing a drawing for four $25 Amazon gift cards. So make sure you stay with us and see if you are a winner. All right, uh, with that, I am pleased to introduce to you today, Frank Sepulveda. He's a data architect with Datastax. And uh, I'm gonna turn my camera off and put myself on mute and Frank, take it away. Thank you, Sharon. So as Sharon mentioned, my name is Frank Sepulveda and I'm a data architect with Datastax. Uh, I've been with Datastax about a year. Uh, prior to that, I spent five years working in oil and gas. And prior to that, I spent 10 years working within defense and intelligence. Uh, the talk title today is The Limitless Possibilities of IoT and Edge Computing with a Modern Distributed Database. So here's our agenda for today. It's going to be some background, actually quite a bit. And then we're going to talk about an edge computing application that I did while I was in graduate school. And then we're going to kind of wrap everything up with a little discussion on a modern distributed database and why I chose Apache Cassandra uh, for my, my graduate work. I uh, put a couple of you know, definitions here on the side uh, in case you have any questions regarding edge computing or what the edge actually is. Uh, but you know, the key thing here is you know, I've, I've had an opportunity to give this talk uh, both in defense of my dissertation but you know, also uh, recently I gave a, a similar talk uh, at the Data Science Salon to kind of discuss the ongoing evolution of fast data architecture. Uh, today, what I'd really like to focus on is why edge computing is necessary and how I went about using you know, commercial off-the-shelf hardware and a modern distributed database, in this case Apache Cassandra, as I previously mentioned, uh, to design and deploy a general purpose edge computing architecture that offers this you know, next level reliability and scalability. So kind of to kick things off with some background, what I'd like to kind of start off with is just kind of briefly review the history of wireless sensor networks and the Internet of Things. And this is really kind of like a, you know, kind of really showing where I came in, you know, where I, I kind of started off my career and, and how that's progressed. So um, the wireless sensor network or WSN and the Internet of Things, I, 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 both of them originated in the late 1990s. Uh, wireless network got you know started a little bit quicker and faster. Uh, really, you know, it was uh, a lot of uh, uh, they were extensively used by the scientific community for environment monitoring. Uh, you know, and all of these components, you know, had become you know the components that make up wireless sensor networks. You know, sensors, transceivers, microcontrollers. Even though they had become readily accessible and relatively inexpensive, the developers that were creating these wireless sensor networks were typically like experts, either you know domain specific experts like zoologists, biologists, you know, geoscientists working closely with other experts like computer scientists, software developers, you know, computer engineers, things like that. Uh, in the early 2010s, uh, you know, keep in mind, I, I came into this career in the early 2000s working for defense and intelligence. Uh, but when I was about to start graduate school, uh, I had kind of noticed in the early 2010s, things had started to change, right? And what happened was, was that there was this transition from what was you know, predominantly interest in wireless sensor networks to this interest in the internet of things, right? And I think what was what was behind this, you know, Internet of Things phenomenon was this convergence of technologies that allowed users to connect things to the Internet relative. Internet of Things just used, you know, TCP/IP, which we're all familiar with. Um, one of the key differentiators also being that, you know, the Internet of Things was, you know, equally inexpensive, uh, even more so maybe, but it was just easy to use. So kind of, you know, what was the tipping point? So what I believe the tipping point was for this transition between wireless sensor networks or, you know, to IoT was this availability of small and inexpensive, you know, low power microcontrollers and single board computers, uh, especially in the, you know, in the early 2010s, um, 
the Arduino, the Gumstick, and of course the extremely popular Raspberry Pi, which is shown here in the bottom uh, right corner. I believe that you know these technologies being available really lowered the barrier of entry to create IoT devices that can support edge computing. So to kind of, you know, you think about this. So if you do find yourself in a situation where you're designing an IoT-based sensor array to deploy in a field setting, especially in a remote location with limited infrastructure, uh, you need to consider your power and your telemetry options uh, very carefully. Now, I kind of probably know what you're thinking. You're like, why would I find myself designing and deploying an IoT-based sensor array? And why would I be doing this out there in the middle of nowhere? Well, you know, the reality is that if you work for an enterprise that engages in agriculture or healthcare or hydrocarbon production or manufacturing, power generation, power generation, excuse me, or uh, transportation, you're likely already collecting and using a lot of sensor data. And whether it be a remote environment like the desert or whether it be an industrially industrial cluttered and noisy, you know, environment like a manufacturing floor or, you know, once again, a very cluttered uh, from a technology perspective, you know, situation like a hospital wing. Uh, you know, these are all things that, that you know, situations where this, this, uh, this information may apply, right? So let's take a, a moment here to kind of consider the state of technology uh, within the power and telemetry space. Uh, so on the left-hand side here, you see an excerpt that I pulled from an article that uh, Scott Johnson recently published that was entitled, you know, internally five years away. No batteries are improving under your nose. Uh, and what he's getting at in this article is he kind of goes on to provide this really great, uh, very well written article that explains how lithium ion batteries work, kind of the characteristics of batteries in general, and why it seems like this new battery technology is always like five years away. And although I really enjoyed this article, you know, it was a little disconcerting when I read this quote right here, which was that the capacity of your current batteries, you know, is over. 1.5 times what they've had a decade ago. And it kind of made sense to me in my head because I've, I've spent a large part of my career hauling around these big 50 pound batteries and I wondered why they never really seemed to get much lighter. I thought it was because I was getting older, but it turns out that when you compare the advancements in technology and you know, uh, you know, uh, CPU or memory or cost of storage compared to the advances in power and you know, specifically batteries, it's much slower. It's a much slower, play, uh, slower pace. So kind of switching to the right hand, and side of the slide here, you know, from a, te a telemetry perspective or network, right? Um, really what we're looking at here is, is on this bottom right side is this map. And uh, this is a network coverage map for one of the three major cellular carriers, right? Uh, purple is illustrated by, you know, 5G. You can see a couple, you know, dots of purple scattered around the country. And then you see 4G plus in orange, excuse me, in red and uh, orange indicates 4G. So, what I kind of want to point out here is that right here, kind of in the middle of the country, in this Midwest region, there's a significant gap of coverage. And of course, you may be asking, well, why should I care, right? I live on the coast, or you know, I live in Dallas or Houston, why do I care? Well, this is the part of the country where we grow corn and a lot of the other feed grains that are used to feed livestock. And of course, Americans do, well, most Americans at least, do love their burgers and bacon. So that's why you should care about this lack of coverage in the Midwest. Uh, well, let's just say you're not a meat eater, right? You don't care about that. Well, let's kind of look over at this region over here to the, uh, the southwest, in which case there's an even more significant coverage gap. And uh, the most notable gap in coverage is in the great state of Nevada, which, of course, happens to be the largest producer of lithium in the United States. And this, of course, is the same lithium that we need for those next generation batteries that we're all so patiently waiting for. So if I had to summarize the purpose of this slide, because I do realize it's kind of probably a little bit of a tangent from what we were thinking this talk would be about, I really like to drive home the point that the technology performance enhancements have significantly outpaced both battery enhancements as well as network availability and even network performance. Right? So we get now here to how did I deal with power and telemetry issues when I was deploying my IoT-based sensors in a field setting? So here you can see my friend Joseph, and I believe that was Dr. Dunbar way off of in the distance there. Uh, you know, we were fortunate enough to deploy in a desert, so we didn't have a lot of vegetation to contend with. Uh, so what we were able to do is just set up an ad hoc wireless network using commercial off-the-shelf components. And here on the top right, you can see my little whip antenna. You know, and that's pretty much how we were able to get our communications. So it's kind of like a bring-your-own network of sorts. 
And the second thing that was kind of, you know, made power and telemetry, you know, easy for us, at least, semi-easy, was that we had plenty of undergraduate and graduate students to help lug dozens of 50-pound batteries uh, into the desert. So here in this box, right here in the middle, uh, it's kind of hard to make out, but there's one of these big 50, uh, excuse me, 50-pound uh, deep-cycle marine batteries in the middle of this box. So at this point, you know, usually someone in the audience, like if I was doing this face to face, um, you know, it's typically someone who works for Amazon, Google, or Microsoft uh, will question the need for this edge based approach. You know, they'll say, hey, Frank, you know, Raspberry Pis, an ad hoc wireless network or an ad hoc network and heavy batteries, like, wouldn't it make more sense to just transmit this data back to a central location and just process it in the cloud? So again, you know, with that in mind, let's talk about this, you know, decentralized versus centralized approach. And let's do this from you know, a power and telemetry perspective. Uh, so about 20 years ago, um, Heinzelman and, you know, and some others, that, uh, they, they put forth this publication that's been very well cited. And you know, it, it has this idea that energy consumption is proportional to the distance between a sensor node and base station. And keep in mind, this came out in, in 2000. This is you know, way before the modern cloud, right? Uh, and, and what this means really is that, you know, given the limited budget of edge devices, and in this case, you know, an edge device could be an IoT device, a mobile device, or, you know, a sensor, a sensor array, uh, you know, edge, and store, edge uh, storage and computing isn't so much a, a nice to have, it's kind of a must have, right? When you consider that, you know, this energy consumption is proportional to the distance that, uh, the, you know, the data has to travel. Uh, but more so, you know, kind of drilling down deeper again on the telemetry side, you know, one of the things that happens is as edge devices you know, become major producers of data, uh, the transmission of large volumes of data to a central location, you know, hence the cloud, particularly, you know, in a place where network coverage is either constrained or non-existent, it has, you know, some impact. And what those impacts include is that it tends to burden network resources, it introduces latency and jitter, you know, and it ultimately impacts user experience. Uh, one final thought on this idea of decentralized versus centralized is this quote that Morgan shared in a blog post back in 2018. And it's this adage of compute is cheap, storage is cheaper, but data movement is very expensive. Um, this, this quote, right, this adage tends to resonate with users and enterprises who have felt you know, the sticker shock uh, after having moved large volumes of data from either cloud provider to cloud provider or from you know, the edge device to excuse me, to the cloud, right? In that it's not cheap. Oftentimes it's cheaper to move the data than it is to store the data. So if anyone is, is still a, you know, a bit skeptical about you know, my concerns regarding power and telemetry limitations, I found this article recently uh, that I'd like to talk about here. So this kind of like wraps up my background section so we can kind of dive in you know, to some of the other work that I've done. But uh, you know, let, let's just kind of look at this article entitled, excuse me, titled <clears throat> The Success of Self-Driving Vehicles Will Depend on Teleoperations. Uh, in this article, you know, Amit uh, Rosenwig discusses the shortfalls of autonomous vehicles. You know, essentially, you know, to just kind of you know, quickest possible summary, uh, autonomous vehicles, you know, the onboard technology, that being the sensors, the algorithms, you know, the data itself, is just not good enough to support the challenges of real world driving conditions where you have you know, poor visibility, you have, you know, drivers doing crazy things on the road or, you know, a deer or a dog running out into the road and you know, presenting some sort of hazard. And this is difficult, but it's even more difficult, you know, when you're dealing with a family, you know, or an individual driving in a vehicle, you know, 75 miles an hour down the road, right? So the solution that Amit puts forth here is this teleoperations, you know, where teleoperations is a technology that allows, you know, one to remotely monitor an autonomous vehicle or vehicles even, and of course take control as needed to solve, you know, problems that pop up, you know, quickly and of course remotely. What, you know, Amit goes back to talk about here though, is he says there's some challenges and I've listed those here on the right hand side, which is, you know, continuous and reliable two-way communication, you know, 4G and LTE, excuse me, 4G LTE or Wi-Fi may not be able to support the high bandwidth, low latency requirements for this to work. I mean, after all, you know, we're talking about, you know, life and death moving at 75 miles an hour along a road. You don't have 500 milliseconds of latency. It's not going to be good enough, right? So um, author goes on to talk about how 5G may help. Uh, but as we saw in that previous image, you know, 5G is only available in select spots right now in the country. And it's going to roll out, but it's going to take a while to catch up. So these challenges will likely uh, remain. So, you know, hopefully this kind of long-winded background that I've 
provided here, you know, talking about power and telemetry and wireless sensor networks and IoT, it's you know, hopefully firmly established in, in your minds that there's this need for yet inherent challenges associated with edge computing, right? So with that being said, what I'd now like to do is talk about an edge computing application uh, that I worked on while I was in graduate school at Baylor University. Uh, this was work that was funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. And what we did was in May of 2019, we deployed 144 seismic stations along a you know, two kilometer seismic line outside of Gerlach, Nevada. Uh, just FYI, there was very little uh, network even in town, uh, let alone out in the desert where we were. And of course, there was no power available. And you know the reason we visited Gerlach uh, wasn't to attend Burning Man. This is actually for anyone who's ever been to Burning Man. This is where Burning Man occurs. And uh, if you see on their sign there, you can see that there are three bars, no churches, and no wars, which I thought was very funny. Uh, clearly, the people of Gerlach have a good sense of humor. Uh, but the reason we went out there wasn't to have fun. It was to demonstrate the feasibility of using an IoT-based sensor array to orchestrate edge storage and computing resources capable of characterizing the subsurface, preferably in near real time. Hence, you know, edge computing. Uh, consider the solution that I'm about to talk about here in these upcoming slides. It's like a prototype edge computing architecture that makes use of this modern distributed database, you know, Cassandra, uh, you know, at the center of the known universe uh, as per Gerlach's funny sign here. So this begs the question, well, why are we even doing this, right? As geoscientists, why are we getting into this space? Why are we jumping into the technology space? And the reason we're doing this is when you look at how data is acquired for, um, you know, for si how seismic, di seismic data is acquired, there are a couple of different ways. Uh, so if you look at this figure that I have right here, you can see that, you know, there's cost along the x-axis and environmental impact along the y-axis. And, you know, you have a permanent and active this would basically mean you have some loud vibrating or explosive source that's constantly going. Uh, this is pretty much a non-starter because nobody wants to live with that. The impact would be profound and the cost would be you know, astronomical. But some of the ones that do exist and that you do run into are a temporary and active solution. Uh, temporary that would be for a finite amount of time, active in that you're actively putting energy into the ground. So this would be kind of like the type of survey that an oil and gas company would do. These surveys usually cost millions of dollars. You can have you know, hundreds, you know, thousands, sometimes even tens of thousands of sensors in the ground, and you bring these large vibrating trucks and trucks in there to you know, put energy into the ground. Very expensive, a lot of environmental impact. Uh, there's another type of solution that's out there for seismic acquisition. This is like a permanent and passive system. Uh, this is a system where you have like some sort of vault room, maybe like a cement bunker type situation and you have a seismometer in there and that seismometer is you know just a single sensor and it collects data and it sends it back to the graduates you know school uh, to the grad school to some poor grad student who's just like sitting there trying to comb through all this data uh, that's you know once again less costly but you know it's permanent so you have to put some infrastructure in what we were going for was a temporary and passive solution temporary in that it was there for a finite amount of time passive in that instead of using an active source we're basically just recording the background noise that's either created by nature or it's just you know human made noise that's unintentional that just happens to be there the reason we wanted to adopt this temporary and passive means was to minimize the cost and risk associated with conventional seismic exploration and monitoring uh, the cost as i you know mentioned here we wanted to reduce cost because the way you reduce cost is by minimizing your time in the field, because the more time you field, uh, spend in the field, the more money you spend. And from a risk perspective, we wanted to you know, reduce our environmental footprint, you know, reducing the impact. And of course, we wanted to you know, verify that we had acquired quality data and that we met our survey objections. The challenge is, since we're employing passive, meaning just ambient noise, just the background noise, how do you know when you're done? And this was really problematic. And this is why it was necessary to come up with an edge computing solution where we could look at our data in near real time to determine the quality of our data and also if we met our survey objections. So kind of break this down into two different phases. Um, you know, the first phase that we, uh, we did was the single node solution. So I mentioned earlier, I was, you know, I used commercial off the shelf hardware. I took a digitizer, you can think of this as just a recorder that you connect a sensor to, and I integrated it with a Raspberry Pi. I basically took the software that was available for this recorder, recompiled it for the ARM architecture of the Raspberry Pi, and then just tested it to verify that it was still you know, giving us quality data. 
Uh, this ended up becoming, uh, you know, a publication that I got out there, uh, and it was called The Rapier, right? The Raspberry Pi and hence RevTech, named after the Raspberry Pi and the RevTech. Uh, my advisor liked it. He said, great single node solution, Frank. He goes, but everything we do in seismology is multi-node. He goes, you need a solution where you can get data from multiple nodes consolidated at the edge and process this data in near real time. What are you going to use? So around 2016 is about when this, this happened, when I was looking into this, uh, I decided to go ahead and, and, and check out what my options were. So before I get into kind of talking about the options and talking about kind of how I made my way through the databases, I kind of want to show you what our prototype edge computing architecture looked like. Um, this is a busy slide, so I'm just going to kind of walk through it from the, from the bottom up. So we had different types of connectivity, be it wireless, wired or wireless, or wired. Uh, that's the reason I use telemetry instead of network or wireless network, because telemetry can be a little bit more flexible. Um, but really kind of what I want to show here is that we had these digitizers and sensors, right? This is these small gray dots. And then on top of that, we had, you know, the Raspberry Pi 3. In this case, I was using the Raspberry Pi 3 because it, it had come out at that point. And each one of these little kind of spider-looking thing here is a raper node. And then I had these raper nodes were inserting data into what was a Cassandra cluster that was located out in the middle of the desert, right? I had originally tried to run Cassandra on the Raspberry Pi 3, but what I found out was that there was about a, a two, uh, two gigabyte limitation on how I could get Cassandra to run reliably, that two gigabytes being RAM, right? And at the time, the Raspberry Pi 3 only had one gigabyte. So I switched to the ASUS Tinkerboard, which is very much like the Raspberry Pi, except that it had the extra gigabyte of RAM for a total of two, which allowed me to run Cassandra out in the desert reliably. And what these four nodes would then do is come together to be a cluster. Data from one of these sensors would get inserted into a Raspberry Pi, which would then get inserted into a Cassandra node. The Cassandra node would then replicate it to another node in the cluster. And what I was faced with at this point was that um, I was I was having intermittent connectivity between my seismic line and kind of like my little headquarters at the middle of the seismic line, and that's simply because of the fact that we had started kind of increasing our distance, right, from you know a few hundred meters to now you know, a few thousand meters. So I needed a new solution. So what I actually used was instead of using open source Apache Cassandra, I switched to DataStax Enterprise which offers some advanced functionalities and some advanced features, one of them being this advanced replication feature. And what that did is that allowed me to replicate data cluster to cluster in a hub and spoke topology. So essentially, if this pipe went down, data at the squadron level, which is what I call this cluster, would not get lost. When the connection came back up, it would then be subsequently replicated to the headquarters cluster. Um, all of this data can then be queried for subsequent seismic processing. The great thing about this architecture is that essentially it just replicates. If I need to go from 36 to 72 to 144 nodes, I basically just keep repeating this pattern. If I find myself in a situation where I have to increase my sample rate so there's more data now coming at me, I basically just kind of branch and cut and split and add more inexpensive hardware. So when you take the hub and spoke topology in conjunction with this kind of branch and cut methodology, it's a very extensible solution. So how did it work, right? Did we accomplish what we were trying to accomplish from a geoscientific perspective? The answer is yes. Uh, we acquired, stored, and processed, uh, you know, seismic data in a field setting in real time. Uh, you know, just to kind of give you some metrics here, you're looking at about 13 million samples per hour or 312 million samples per day, uh, and greater than 99% of the data acquired was stored, queried, and extracted for subsequent seismic processing. So it uh, worked very well. From a more general perspective, and, and I'm thinking about this general perspective from kind of like a science engineering perspective, but nonetheless, I think that this could translate over into a lot of different application areas. Um, but what we're looking at here is there was this highly scalable solution for write heavy workloads. Uh, you could use the same distributed database across a variety of hardware. So I actually used Cassandra on, you know, Asus Tinkers. I used it on laptops. I used it on, you know, the Nook computers, you know, just all kinds of different hardware. It runs the same. 
Uh, you could do the seamless replication of data along a continuum of locations. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned, we didn't have any cellular service at where we were, so I wasn't able to test the edge to cloud aspect of this, but in theory, the same database could be used on small computers out in the field or you know, servers at a data center or you know, VMs in a cloud, right? Uh, and really what it all equals is that there's this general purpose edge computing architecture that offers next level reliability and scalability. If you're interested in learning a little bit more about this from a diff someone else's perspective, uh, you know, uh, Jack Vaughn uh, has this publication right here, which I've given a link for, where he talks about a summary of a different talk I did where I focus more on the seismic side of things. So now this kind of brings us in the last part of our talk here. Where we really want to dig into a modern distributed database, why Cassandra? I hate to use the term, but the reality is, is that seismic you know, data is a big data problem. You're talking millions to tens of millions of samples per day, you know, kind of spread over, uh, you know, being collected by a large number of nodes spread over a lot of distance. Uh, some of the folks that are working in this space in the geoscience community are still, like recently, like in the last year or two, still using uh, relational databases, right? Uh, MySQL is very popular. I had thought about using MySQL at the beginning, but I had moved away from it simply because of the fact that I had concerns regarding scalability. Uh, some of the aspects about how, you know, uh, SQL works from, you know, kind of like if you look at the cap theorem there, from an availability and consistency perspective, right, that's what they focus on. You know, there's this concern that because of the blocking protocol, you know, that the failure of a single node could impede progress, or even just the slowing down of a single node could potentially uh, impede progress across the entire cluster. So back in 2016, I started looking for alternatives uh, to Apache Cassandra. And some of the alternatives that I looked at were like, um, there was a paper that came out by Confias and his some of his collaborators uh, out of France, and you know they had looked at you know, interplanetary file system uh, Rados and as kind of like a way to do fog or edge computing infrastructures, right? Uh, so that's kind of what, where I started, you know, looking at something else, something that could scale to hundreds of nodes spread across thousands of meters. You know. Ultimately, my choice was to go with Apache Cassandra, and in, in my case, specifically DataStax Enterprise, so that I could realize that hub and spoke topology that I was after. And I used this in order to orchestrate you know, my edge storage and computing resources as opposed to MySQL. Uh, the reasons behind this, like if I just had to kind of like, you know, list them out, um, is I needed something that would go beyond you know, small scale sensor arrays spread over much shorter distance. I needed something that would be able to give me scalability both you know, geographic scalability as well as node count scalability, but that had you know kind of met these requirements right here. One, obviously no single point of failure. I needed high availability. I needed linear scalability. Basically, I just keep replicating my hardware, which was inexpensive and reliable. I needed something that was very well suited to time series data. Uh, Cassandra is very well suited to time series data simply because of the fact that it reads and writes data to disk sequentially. Um, it's just how Cassandra operates. I mean, provided you do have to do some good data modeling, but it's nothing to be scared of. But essentially, with one when, with a good data model, I can design it so that with one I/O operation, I read all of the data that I need, you know, without having to make you know multiple searches and reads from disks. But the thing that really kind of sold me on Cassandra was as I kind of started researching, especially you know, looking through the IEEE journals and whatnot, you know, what would be good solutions, what are necessary to be able to do this at the edge where you're gonna lose nodes, you're gonna lose connectivity. I really liked the fact that there were a lot of like, if you open the hood of Cassandra, there are a lot of mechanisms, you know, anti-entropy, gossiping, you know, gossip protocols, uh, bloom filters, Merkle trees. There's all kinds of just great, you know, academic, themed stuff going on underneath the hood. You could get a PhD in each one of these topics if you wanted to, right? Uh, you know, and of course I wasn't trying to build the next gen database. I was trying to make a solution that geoscientists could implement, you know, in a relatively short period, a uh, short, you know, short amount of time. So that's kind of like, was really just like the, the closer, right? Where I was like, man, I really like all of these mechanisms that Cassandra has running underneath the hood. I believe they're gonna help keep my data quality uh, there and allow me, you know, the flexibility and the performance that I need to be able to process data in near real time. And getting close to the end here, uh, in retrospect, if, you know, I could go back and do things again, you know, today, uh, since, uh, you know, I completed, um, you know, my work uh, in May of 2019, and then of course, subsequent, you know, uh, uh, the write-ups and whatnot, um, Raspberry Pi Foundation has put out two and four and eight gigabyte versions of the Raspberry Pi. I think this would kind of help simplify 
uh, the architecture from a hardware perspective, just from a continuity perspective, but it also kind of opens up the possibility of maybe even considering, you know, doing more complex, more robust processing in the field, uh, even, you know, potentially, you know, utilizing some of these, you know, more performant, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi 4s to even do like, you know, Spark type jobs in the field, like, uh, you know, distributed and memory processing. Um, another thing, you know, that I'd like to consider is, you know, I was kind of in a, in a, in a bit of a bind. I had a time constraint, which is very tight. So I ended up, you know, going from, you know, open source Apache Cassandra 3.11 to, you know, Datastax Enterprise, uh, you know, I want to say 6.0. Uh, and, and it worked extremely well, especially from a hub and spoke perspective. But there's a, a lot of work that's been done around Cassandra 4.0. It's extremely well, you know, well tested and it's a very reliable release. And you know, there's so many performance enhancements with Cassandra 4.0 that I think potentially I could keep it open source while simultaneously, you know, squeezing much more juice out of the hardware. Um, another thing that I'd like to consider is back in, you know, when I was looking at this in 2016, I'd considered, you know, using something like Kafka maybe. Or something similar. Uh, at the time, there was nothing that really kind of had the distributed nature that I needed, uh, particularly, you know, from a you know, separation of compute and storage and geo replication perspective. I think if, if I were to go back and do it again, I'd consider maybe you know, introducing uh, Pulsar to the mix. And of course, uh, if I could go back and do it again, I would like to really kind of do an edge to cloud approach where at each step along the way, we are reducing, we are combining, we are enriching the data so that the amount of data that makes it to the cloud is less, right? Which would be best because we really need, you know, the context awareness at the edge. We need the AI and ML at the edge. We don't necessarily need all of the data back at the cloud immediately, right? We need to be able to take action, you know? Uh, so, um, I would, uh, if I could go back and do it again, I would have maybe budgeted some money for, uh, you know, satellite communications. So maybe we could have gotten um, some of the data out to the cloud. Uh, you know, of course, I work for Datastax now, so there's a shameless plug here for Datastax Astra, which is Datastax uh, multi-cloud database as a service, uh, which is, of course, built on top of Apache, Apache Cassandra, uh, on top of Apache Cassandra, available on all three of the cloud providers. But it would have been a good way to demonstrate how, using the same data store, you could have made multiple stocks along the way. And I think that would have been pretty cool, a pretty cool thing to do. Lastly, since you know this was a work that was kind of uh, sponsored by the United States government, I have to put this disclaimer up here if I talk about it. So uh, there's my obligatory disclaimer. And at this point, I'd just like to say thank you. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions. That was a fascinating, and uh, I don't know if I'm aging myself or what, but it, um, can you imagine if they had this technology in tremors, like the whole thing was completely <laughs> different. <laughs> That's, you know, it, it's, it's funny because, um, I've, I've, I've been able to work, uh, you know, kind of the seismic side from oil and gas perspective, but also from defense and intelligence perspective. And then of course in graduate school, and, you know, and if you, if you think about, you know, the average Toyota, and this is a couple of years ago when I read this article, has 1,600 sensors, you know, maybe 30 to 60 computers, right? I mean, it's the sensor data really is king, right? So, um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would have yep. definitely helped uh, in tremors. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. Uh, all right. Um Let's see. So we do have a couple questions here. Um, uh, what other, and I know you um, you did touch a little bit on SQL, but um, what other databases did you consider before ultimately choosing Cassandra? Yeah, there were, there were, there was, like I said, there was a great paper that came out. Um, it was the performance analysis of object source systems in fog slash edge computing infrastructures. And the author of this paper, uh, Confias and his collaborators, they talked about three. They talked about Rados, they talked about IPFS, where IPFS is the interplanetary file system. So basically, it's like blit tor a bit torrent in space. Right. And I, I looked at all three because, you know, he, you know, they had done this great comparison. And honestly, Rados was just prohibitively complex compared to Cassandra. IPFS was interesting. And in fact, my advisor really liked IPFS because he thought it would be, you know, it was kind of cool, right? It was, it was you know, interplanetary. Hey, that's where we want to go, right? We want to collect seismic data on Mars. We're already doing it, right? But, you know, kind of eventually, you know, my thoughts on the matter was, well, who used BitTorrent to download music, 
or who will admit to having used BitTorrent to download music, right? So uh, I ended up kind of getting away from it just because there really wasn't a whole lot of support and contributors to the project versus Apache Cassandra, which has a ton of contributors. And of course, one of the largest contributors just so happens to be Apple, right? So it's the major contributors are Datastax, Apple, and Netflix. Um, and I thought about it from this perspective is to say, well, if you basically ever touched an iPhone, you touch Cassandra whether you realize it or not, right? And even though IPFS was kind of novel and interesting, I decided to go something that I thought that was going to be just more sustainable and supportable. Gotcha. Um, here's another good one. Um, how how did the Raspberry Pi work in the desert? Did it did it work well? What were the you know, I got to tell you, I'm a huge fan of the Raspberry Pi. Uh, if I had had that when I was a kid, I would have like been way cooler than Data from Goonies. Because like, I it was just, I'm dating myself now, Sharon. Uh, <laughs> so it, it not only did it do extremely well, just from a suitability perspective, right? Like it, it operated in the environment. It, for some reason, my advisor would always schedule these events to coincide with record heat waves um, to the to the point that like the, the soles came off my my steel toed boots while we were out in Nevada uh, the first time, the second time. Yeah, it, it was brutal heat. Um, so uh, regardless, you know, it suitability, it did extremely well in the desert, uh, even amongst, you know, uh, surprisingly moist conditions sometimes um, from a performance perspective, it was just incredibly reliable. I mean, it, it really was. It's just a workhorse. And there's a reason why anytime anyone says, hey, I want to learn about you know Linux or coding or just you know connect with my kids over some cool project, it's like, go buy a Raspberry Pi. It's like the first thing I tell them. Yeah. Um, so, and it, it makes me think there was this great video back in the day that I saw, which kind of like really just sold me on the Raspberry Pi for my application, where I think it's like, it's Jonathan Ellis, and I want to say it's Patrick McFadden from Datastax, and they're demoing the, the resiliency of Cassandra because they had set up a Cassandra cluster uh, with these Raspberry Pis, and they're smashing them with a hammer and showing you how you can lose nodes and still get data. And it was just, it was tactile, you know, and it, it really, yeah, and I've been in situations where nodes have been run over by a truck or have been chewed up by a cow. So the, the Raspberry Pi did extremely well. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to kind of extrapolate uh, a little bit here. Um, there's a comment in the chat that touches on some of the s potential security issues um, with wireless edge components. Um, how did you handle how did you handle that um, having those components and um, securing them? You know, and, and I'm not trying to be glib about this or, or flippant or anything. Um, I, If you look at the majority of the publications on IoT, if you go to IEEE right now, you're going to see a ton of publications on you know, protocols, on standards, and on security. It's one of the hottest topics. Um, for me specifically, honestly, I was more concerned about getting eaten by a mountain lion while I was walking out there by myself or stepping on a rattlesnake than I was about someone connecting to our ad hoc network and, you know, you know, hacking or corrupting or do anything to our system. Um, whoever asked that, whoever put that comment in there, I'm going to say absolutely. Uh, it's something that you need to be aware of, especially if you're looking for, you know, industrial or commercial applications. You know, some of the applications that, that I think, you know, could be useful here, you know, autonomous vehicles, obviously nobody wants their vehicle hacked, especially while they're driving 75 miles an hour. Uh, you know, predictive maintenance of field equipment and vehicles. Once again, there's potential hazards here, both, you know, safety and environmental, uh, remote industrial, scientific and monitoring. We've seen some hackings recently, you know, power grid as well as, you know, manufacturing facilities for food, uh, remote patient, you know, healthcare monitoring. Your Apple Watch and a lot of your, you know, your smart devices are acquiring more and more personal data regularly. Um, you know, you don't want this getting out there. So yes, please do exercise extreme caution. Unfortunately, or I should say fortunately, I really didn't have to concern myself with that, but uh, it's something that if I were doing this uh, you know, for a company, for an enterprise, I would. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so Another comment here um, is talking about a company called Fleet Space that's 
putting up low altitude satellites that talk to edge devices in remote locations, which sounds really fascinating. I've not heard of them, but I will look mm -hmm. into that. Uh, what do you think about this approach to solving the network issue? You know, I, I think that if anything, my, my talk today has showed that it is important to keep an open mind and just be creative on how you to try to solve these problems. I think that that's a great idea. Um, the one thing I will say is this, when I worked at, at an oil and gas company, one of the directors of IT said, hey, Frank, we're, we're setting up our infrastructure so that our rigs that are out in the middle of you know, West Texas can communicate all their data back. He said, how much bandwidth do you need? And I, of course, was, was working as a data scientist for them. I kind of smiled and I said, if you give me more bandwidth, I'm going to add more sensors or up my sample rates. And he was like, why? And I said, well, as you try to do more complex AI and ML, increasing your sample rates allows you to get better resolution of the event or activity you're trying to monitor. You can think of it this way, Sharon. If our, my audio is breaking up and you can only hear every third word, you could probably make out what I'm saying, but it'd be a little painful. But if you can only hear every 10th word, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Right. right. So when you increase your sample rates, you get a better picture of what's going on. Right. So that's the reason why. So when you're when you're talking about putting out these solutions, I think it's a combination of both doing the edge computing, doing the processing reduction enrichment of data and then using technologies like like you described, I believe it was fleet space in order to exfil the data that you need to make the critical decisions, right? So if you notice a failure occurring because of weather related activity in the Northwest part of Texas, and you know that front is moving to the Southeast and you're seeing devices start to fail, you start taking action so that you're shutting down components along the way so you don't get caught with your pants down, right? Uh, metaphorically speaking. So I, I think that that's great. Um, I think for, you know, and I, the reason I put up that map is, is, you know, I was a bit of a country boy and I grew out in the country and even where I'm sitting right now, if, if I have one bar of service, I'll be impressed. Okay. Right now I have one bar, right? So um, it, it's, you know, there's, there's a lot of people spread all over this country doing great work and great work that, you know, once again, supports the entire country in some cases, even the world. So let's make sure we take care of them too. Yeah. I, Agree. Um, all right, let's see. I think we've got time for one more. Um, how do you see a Raspberry Pi with Linux capability compared to, I'm sorry, I'm gonna screw up this acronym here. Um, I, I can I can take this in here. Grab this so, one, are you seeing it? <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, to yeah to to the ups which i'm actually not familiar with but i are but i am familiar with the rtos right the real-time operating system you know at what level of hardware distinguishes a necessary level of processing I, i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you like this when i first gave this talk when i gave my dissertation proposal right i gave the you know, I, I kicked it out there and when i submitted my publication to electronic seismologists my reviewers my advisors their first thing they came back to me is why aren't you using the arduino because at the time the arduino was king and the Arduino used a real-time operating system. And my response to them was like, look, one, uh, oh, microprocessors, thank you, Mike. Um, so uh, one, I'm not that good of a programmer. I'm a geoscientist, right? So programming in Python is a heck of a lot easier for me than working in C Sharp, right? Or C++ or whatever. So I, I like the fact that with the Pi, it was very Python-centric. It was easy for me to get started as a coder. Uh, two, I didn't want to have to recreate the wheel, right? I wanted to take the software that had already been developed for, you know, full, you know, either 32 or 64 bit Linux and see if I could, you know, recompile it and run it on the ARM architecture for the Raspberry Pi. So really it was just me being lazy <laughs> and not wanting to have to go in and, and do this. Now, but keep in mind, I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a geoscientist, but I did have uh, an electrical engineer on my committee, you know, Dr. Thompson out of Baylor University. And you know, it was one of the things that he brought up. He said, hey, why didn't you use this? Or why didn't you use these other ones? Uh, it was just an ease of use. But thank you for that question, Mike. That's a good question. Yeah. Okay. See, I was even interpreting that wrong because I would have said UPS was, you know, universal or um, uninterrupted power supply. But uh, I'm, thanks, right there, I'm right there with you. Yeah, <laughs> so thanks for clarifying that, Mike. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
right. I think that uh, I think that about covers um, all the questions here. If you do still have a question, um, I still have a couple housekeeping things I need to wrap up. So go ahead and submit those if you haven't already. We will send those over to Frank and he can uh, follow up with you. Oh, you know what? We have plenty of time. I'm going to go ahead and take this question, uh, Linda. How fast um, How fast will the micro SD on Pi wear out? And uh, what level write IO data stacks distributed database? I'm um, sure I parted I can, that wrong. Yeah, I can I can answer the first part of that question. Okay. Um, so I think I think what Linda's mentioning here is what happens is when you have repeated writes to a micro SD card, um, essentially, you know, it's a limited amount, right? You can only write to it so many times. Uh, typically, it's a very large amount of writes, but nonetheless, if you're continuously writing to it, you can have an issue. One of the great things about Apache Cassandra is that one of the first settings that you have to tune in order for Apache Cassandra to run well is you have to turn off swap, Linda. So with that being said, swap is typically what does a lot of the recurring writing to the disk, right, to the actual micro SD card on the Pi. So I actually never had an issue, and I had Pies that were up and running, you know, testing on the bench for years, uh, you know, a year plus. Uh, I typically really push the limit on the size of my micro SD cards. Uh, simply because of the fact that I wanted to have plenty of over room, uh, overhead room. So usually I would use 128 gig, big, gig cards, you know, to the point that when I would use Etcher to kind of flash my, my, you know, uh, uh, Raspberry Pi OS on there, it would say, are you sure you want to do this? But I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> like I want to do this. So um, really it, it, I never had an issue with it. Um, on what level write IO data stacks distributed data? I, I'm not exactly sure that's a part of the same question or if it's a different question. So if you'd like to clarify that one, either if we have time, please throw it in chat. If not, send me a message. Uh, anyone, uh, send me a message on LinkedIn. Uh, my contact information is there. Uh, please reach out to me. I'm happy to connect. Uh, I believe my email is at the beginning of this slide deck, so. Cool. All right, folks. So um, just as a reminder, this has been recorded. I know some folks were asking about that. So yes, uh, this has been recorded. You'll be able to go back and watch it again at your leisure. Uh, we'll be sending an email with instructions for how to access the webinar on demand, or you can always go to devops.com slash webinars, and it will be there for you as well. Um, all right, let's choose our Amazon gift card winners here. Our first winner for today is Carl M. Congratulations, Carl. Next, our winner is Samuel T. Congratulations, Samuel. Our third winner of the day is Ron K. And finally, Howard D. Congratulations to all our Amazon winners. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll be sending you an email with instructions for how to claim your gift card. If you don't see it in your inbox, please make sure and check your spam folder. Oh, Frank, thank you so much for joining us today and uh, for this awesome presentation. Thank you so much to the audience for your amazing questions and for sharing your time with us. We always appreciate it. And uh, we hope to see you again soon at another DevOps.com webinar. With that, thank you again. I'm Sharon Florentine signing off.